they got the green light going and yelling at me at 7 o'clock. So, and then somebody will inevitably be mad. Tonight it will be my wife if I go over. So I, I have to go home with that. So, <laughs> or show up some point tonight. <laughs> uh, what a great day. Isn't this great? The sun shines out there. Everything's green. It's pretty soon it will be self-igniting. <laughs> 107. I remember the first summer I was here, which wasn't that long ago. I was getting ready for camp this time of the year, and they were telling me it was be 115 the whole week. <laughs> and I'm going, no, 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 you don't do camp at 115. You, you, you stay in. So anyway, well, praise the Lord, it's not that bad. So it is uh, pretty, though. A lot of stuff bloom in that front. Uh, again, I, I sent out an email thanking everybody for the work we did in the building, but that front facade, when you first pull up, you go, <laughs> All around here looks like, yes. So just pray for me and the garbage man because he may get mad at me Friday. <laughs> so let's pray before we get into Jonah chapter 3. Father God, what a wonderful, gracious opportunity you give us to come together, to look into your word, to understand what it has for us. Uh, these, these are just not stories that occurred. They're, they're put in here for a reason, for us to understand how you operate with uh, men and how you use men within that uh, plan that you have. Father, we once again thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Jonah chapter 3. Well, actually, hold your finger in Jonah chapter 3. We're going to go. I didn't finish something I wanted to do in Deuteronomy 18. So turn to Deuteronomy 18, and then we'll, finish, we'll go right to Jonah. We won't be long in Deuteronomy 18. I just want to make a couple of points. What we were talking about was the difference between God's of the pagans, the, in this case the Ninevites, the Assyrians, and the God of the Hebrews. Um, one of the things you do have to know is as bad as Israel always was, and it seemed to be um, spiritually, how much they had swayed away from God, they, still had, they were still very different than the pagans around them. Uh, they did incorporate idolatry, they did sway from that, and God does punish them. But they still had a system intact, they still had the law, They still had the sacrificial system, so everybody would know that they were different, okay? And that did bring somewhat of a a seedbed for any kind of a gospel given to them. Uh, When I say gospel, remember, it's just good news. So they didn't have the good news we have. They had good news, okay? So with that being in, what we're dealing with in Deuteronomy 18 was how God operates, and what we talked about in verses uh, 9 through 11 is what God says this was detestable. This was not the way he wanted to hear from people. Um, he didn't want them to try and seek God in that way. And I want to read what Kyle and Dietrich had to say about the gift of prophecy at that time. These guys are a famous uh, commentators. They did the whole Old Testament. It's one of the uh, older standards if you go to seminary that they require you to have or research from. But if you have anything electronic or if you have the ability to get it, it is now, I think, public domain. So you can get the whole set for free if you want a PDF of it. I'm pretty sure. Um, but anyway, and, and it's pretty intense and most of their stuff is pretty good. Uh, Keel and Dietrichs. Um, the, the Levitical priests, as stated, guardians and protectors of the law. <clears throat> excuse me, had to conduct all affairs of Israel with the Lord, not only instructing the people out of the law concerning the will of God, but sustaining and promoting the living fellowship with the Lord, both of individuals and of the whole congregation, by the offering of sacrifices and services at the altar. But the covenant fellowship with himself and his grace, in which Jehovah had placed Israel as his people of possession, was to be manifested and preserved as a living reality amidst all the changes in the political development of the nation and in the circumstances of private life. It would not do the revelations from God to cease with the giving of the law and the death of Moses. Basically what it's saying is they continued to do the things God had told them to do even though it wasn't a heart condition. It was a ritual. So when Jesus, even when Jesus comes on this earth, the temple is still very much a busy place and a business place. A <laughs> bunch, bunch of things going on at the temple, but it's still doing what we would consider the sacrificial system. Um, I can still kind of visualize Jesus on the cross dying and all the sheep being slaughtered 
as a backdrop to what was happening with the Lamb of God on the cross and all the sheep being slaughtered. So they were being slaughtered because the sacrificial system was very much intact. So that's, that's kind of what we're looking at when we look at this idea. Uh, uh, so when Israel was ma- uh, given a mandate by God to enter the land and to possess their possessions, they weren't to imitate those who were in the land who were ed- already mm, detestable. <laughs> they were doing the detestable things. They were doing things diametrically opposed to what God had said to worship Him and Him alone. So... When we did, we went through that list, the litany there in verses 10 and 11. Um, verse 12 says this, though. Whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord, and because of these detestable things, the Lord your God will drive them out before you. So um, God kind of says, you know, he repeats it a little differently. He basically says it's a big yelling of don't do it, or else I'll do something. Um, verse 13 says, and this is the purpose statement, you shall be blameless before the Lord. They had an immediate responsibility to God Himself. So that's kind of where we're at when we're dealing with Deuteronomy chapter. Some of you just walking in Deuteronomy 18. We're going to go to verse 14 real quick. Deuteronomy 18, verse 14. Um, I think sometimes when we come to the Bible, we come to the Bible as human looking to understand God from our vantage point. God doesn't do that. When God talks about himself, he talks about himself to people from his vantage point down. So we got a big problem, don't we? We have to think about God in terms with a really limited ability. Our framework is very small. So God says this in verse 14. For those nations which shall you, you shall disp- dis- dis- dispossess, listen to those who practice witchcraft, to diviners, but as for you, and this is as strong as you can make it, as dogmatic as possible, but as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do so. (laughs) Big sign that says, don't do this. Which is interesting, because God himself is telling how he is to be approached and how not to approach God. And he says, don't do this. Uh, it, which is interesting because within the record of the Bible, we have God revealing to man who he is, how to worship him, how to approach him, what he needs, what he wants, um, how he uh, is sovereign, how he loves. How do we, if it wasn't for the biblical record, how would we know who God is? We'd have to come up with our own standard and make up a God, and we would be right where the Ninevites are, making up gods to their own understanding, and it's not the biblical God. Um, let's, let's kind of maintain this here now for one thing we do have to understand as believers and Bible seekers, we want to know what the biblical understanding is, not what the Christian understanding is or what the religious understanding is, because we could be very swayed by man's understanding being put into that. Uh, there's a lot of things that we have in, even in Christianity, people will quote like it's a Bible verse. And you, and if you really think about it, you go, where's that found? And you can't find the address to that. Um, but here's what we, we kind of left off last week with verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. Um, Moses is saying that, like me. there will be a prophet that comes like me, um, which was so different than the prophet's and uh, the diviners and whatever you want to call these people that were in verses 10 and 11. Um, he was a prophet that God had called out to speak for him. Um, and notice what it says at the end of it. You shall listen to him. There will be a prophet like me and you shall listen to him. Uh, there were shadow prophets of Moses that came along. But the prophet it's really speaking about is Jesus Christ. The Messiah would be that prophet like Moses. Um, we don't have time to go into that, but maybe when we go into Romans 9, 10, and 11, we'll kind of look at that a little bit because that has a lot to do with that. But verse, drop down to verse 18, though. It says, I will raise up a prophet from among your countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he will speak to them as I command him. And it shall come about, whoever uh, will not listen to my words, which I speak in my name, I myself will require of him. So again, um, what we see more than anything is a prophet speaks 
Bible. Uh, if that kind of makes it clearer, uh, we we don't speak what we what we think is Bible. We got to find the address. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I was talking to somebody the other day, and he says, "You know, it's, it's Christianity. Living a Christian life is as simple as reading God's Word." That sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? And how many people fail to just read God's Word? Because it's God doing what? Speaking to us. Um, through d- different prophets and then the prophet. Uh, that's why um, Hebrews talks about how we've gotten lessons from the prophet, but his, in these last days he's spoken to us through his son. So, um, for instance, let me ask you something. I'm going to say we are all born sinners. Amen. That's biblical, isn't it? Hopefully, prayerfully. Can we find that outside the biblical record? Can we really find in, in a record outside of the walls of Scripture that man is born a sinner? No. Man is either what? Innately good? Or, or we would say okay. Okay? Or he's bad. He's evil. Um, and that just, that's not even close to what it is. Um, so when we say man is a sinner and God has a large gap between himself and that sinner, how will we find a way to fill that gap? Can you find it outside of the Bible? You can't. And, and I, th- I think this is important for us to, to know these things, because when we go into the Bible, and we're talking about these two different groups of people, uh, the, pe- the polytheistic people, um, um, who basically said, if I've, you know, straight on the wrong side of the sidewalk, what God have I offended? You know, and, and then uh, we have those people that have listened to the Lord God who understand what the Bible says and saying, I've, I've offended God and how I offended God because I'm a sinner and I've fallen short of the glory of God. So there's, there's, there's kind of that gap-filling ability is only comes from the Bible. Um, uh, I want to kind of give one more point and then we're going to go to Jonah chapter 3. Um, and I think it has to do with judgment, because we're going to talk about judgment. And if I say you're going to go stand before the judge tomorrow, and you've got to go to court f- for whatever fine it is, um, you're going to a judge that discriminates. You know that, right? You know why he does? You may just not like... I was sitting in a courtroom, I'll never forget this one day, and a kid came in, and he looked kind of a little bit schlumpy, and the judge threw him out of his courtroom. Just get out of my courtroom. You don't enter my courtroom like that. And the kid was there for a, a, a moving, a speeding violation, uh, not a uh, speeding, but a ticket, a violation of some vehicle law, and the court, judge threw him out of the courtroom, and I'm going, I'm glad I... I'd, you know, I should have worn a tie, maybe, but I mean, I dressed nicely, and he... He threw him out, but he was he, he discriminated because his judgment that he already made was he judged the person's what? Appearance. His appearance. His outward appearance. We do that, don't we? Okay. I mean, it's just... See, um, God judges because God can, dis, can basically define his discrimination because he says, I am righteous and I am just. Everybody else is not. That's how God defines that. When, he, when these gods, the paradigm of gods that these people had, um, they didn't know what the, um, the gauge was. Okay? Um, God said, be holy as I am holy. That's kind of a gauge, isn't it? And most of us could say what? No way. Okay, well, good. That's honest. Uh, what happened is the Israelites didn't say no way. Okay? They didn't say... Look, go to Exodus chapter 19. I just want you to see, because there's a few things we need to see going into this. Um, Because when the the Exodus generation came out, you know what kind of mentality they had, didn't you? They had a worldly mentality. They had not been instructed. The the generation that came out of Egypt, what had they been instructed in? No, being Egyptian. They were Egyptian slaves, right? Did they have any real biblical instruction? No, no, until they hit the wilderness, right? And what the instruction they got was visual, a lot of visual. They saw God do miracles. They saw God part the Red Sea. They saw Moses and his leadership. But they really didn't have a lot of what we would call biblical instruction. So in, in verse 19, in chapter 19, not verse 19, uh, Exodus chapter 19. Uh, 
Uh, verse, verse 7. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him. Now remember, the Lord had commanded Moses to command the people. So he's going to the, the leadership and saying, this is what the Lord's commanded me. And all the people answered together. Here's what they said. All the people answered this together. That was like a unified choir. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Uh, wrong answer. You just failed the test. Um, it's, a good, it's a good thought. But they haven't even, if you really realize where you're at in Exodus, they haven't got the rules yet. I, I don't like, I, I like playing a lot of games, board games and, and physical games, but I don't like playing when I don't know the rules or when the mo- rules keep changing my wife. Where is she? <laughs> you don't change the rules in the middle of a game, right? People get upset. Oh, she just forgot to tell you that one. That's right. <laughs> I forgot to tell you that rule. Really? Um, but we don't do that. But here's Israel willing, willingly saying we will do it, not we will obey it, we will do it before they got the rules. And then notice what it says, and Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. Now here's now what their track record basically is, is they never admit that they can't do it and they need help. We will fall short, Lord help us, until, um, until that generation basically dies off. So let's go to Jonah with all this stuff in our back of our minds. Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3, verse... We'll just start in the first one. We kind of did a little bit last week. Um, I was watching um, in Branson. They have a place called the Sight and Sound Studio. And they're doing Jonah now. <laughs> yes! Timing's everything. <laughs> Timing's everything. But I, I saw a little vignette of Jonah running through the town. Forty days, yet judgment. Forty days, yet judgment. And you kind of think that's the, like the weakest possible, um, what we would call, uh, yeah, not even warning. But if you ever think of somebody setting up their soapbox in the middle of a mall, you know, what, you know fire and brimstone. You know, if you all don't repent, you're going to burn and die and go to the place with, you know, uh, double hockey sticks kind of thing. You know, and, and, and you get all fearful and you want to put fear into them. And you think of Jonah's message. What fear did it bring? What understanding about sin did it bring? What understanding about our Savior did it bring? And I go, all of it. All of it. Um, and it's a simple message. Um, for, uh, so let's read 1 through 4. And then we'll, go, we'll kind of dissect it a little bit. It says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Uh, once we start there, we're on good footing. God's going to tell Jonah, again, to go do something. And God's going to tell him what to say. God's never wrong, right? So all you have to do is do what God says, repeat what God says. It's got to be a really good message. So let's start off on that ground. It's a really good message. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Repeat, rise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to that uh, to the to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. So Jonah rose, went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days walk. Um, it's a pretty big city. So uh, verse 4 says, Then Jonah began to go through the city, one day's walk. That means he started off and he started crying out. And we don't know how many times. We don't know how loud. We don't know what kind of diction he used. Isn't that great? You know, I always think of him as a southern fire and brimstone Baptist Jewish prophet, you know, y'all got to repent because 40 days from now, you know, and, and that kind of idea. But I don't know how he said it. It says yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Hold your finger here. Go to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. We'll go right back. Luke 11. And we kind of briefly went through this a few weeks ago, but I didn't hit it at the same angle. So we're going Luke chapter 11, going at it at a different angle. Verse 29, it says, And as the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is a wicked generation. Now this is preaching, people. <laughs> what generation can't we say that about, though, really? This, this generation is a wicked generation. It seeks a sign, and yet no sign shall be given it, but the sign of Jonah. Um, which is interesting, because this has a double understanding here, because it says, just as Jonah became a sign to who? 
So Jonah was assigned to what? Ninevites. So when Jonah walked around saying he had 40 days you know, in, in the judgment, Jonah was also a living sign. Just think about this for a minute. Um, so assigned so, uh, to the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man to be to this generation. So we got to say, what was Jesus to his generation as Jonah was to his generation? You get how it reads, right? Okay. Um, uh, it says, then we'll just go on for to get to 32 also. It says, the Queen of South shall rise up for, with the men of this generation at the judgment, condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they re- repented. They repented. They changed their mind about something. At the preaching of Jonah, that simple message, they repented, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So here's the two things we've got out of this. He was a sign, and the people repented. He was a sign, and the people repented. So let's go back to Jonah, chapter 3. Thank you for having that little bit of light, right? Otherwise, we'd be walking around and saying, hey, the message we need to, pre- to preach to America right now is yet 40 days and America will be destroyed, which probably work out some in some parts. But, um, but here's the interesting thing. Just think about it for a minute. Here's two parts to the message. Two parts to the message. 40 days and judgment. Two parts. Think about it for a minute. What does 40 days represent to anybody in this room? Think about 40 days. Okay, we could do the flood. We'll, do, we'll, we'll kind of work around with those numbers. But what else? What is 40 days? Uh, let me ask you a different way. What's that? 40 days. Yeah, there's a lot of 40 days. Let me re-ask the question. I'm going to ask it a different way. I'm going to ask it a different way. Could, does judgment sometimes bring immediate results? Do you ever say to your kid, you're disciplining your kid, and say, you deserve this, in 40 days we'll revisit this? Because <laughs> what's going to happen in 40 days? The mind is going to be not thinking about that anymore. We usually think of judgment, and it's deservable, because God's announcing judgment. It's deservable, right? Um, does he have to give a time frame? Yet he does give a time frame. So what's the first thing you should think about? If God gives you time, he gives you... Who said that? I heard somebody. Grace, right? Grace. It's a grace period. Doesn't you ever call up your credit card company and say, well, I need 30 more days. I need a grace period. Isn't that cool? You know who made that up? God. (laughs) God's going to give them 40 days. Uh, Basically, when Jonah began his message, they were on the clock. So they get 40 days, a time period. God didn't have to give them 40 days. I want want to be as clear as I can. Um, 40 days usually has to do, for the number 40, we'll look at it in a minute, has to do with certain ideas in Scripture. God uses numbers a lot, doesn't he? I was looking at the number 12,000. You know how many times that appears in Scripture? It's a lot of times. You say 12,000 is an odd number to appear a lot of times. Why does all these troops, in this case, troops have 12,000 people? Well, they count. Okay, 11,999. I need one more. Anybody want to come to this team? You know, kind of, but it's like 12,000, 12,000, 12,000. Uh, 40 is kind of an interesting thing. Well, let's, let's just, for the sake of conversation, let's, let's just t- talk about it for a minute. Um, Sam, you said 40 days in what? In, in the desert? Well, it's 40 years. 40 years. A couple times. How many years, was, how, how many years was Moses in the desert? This is a trick question. This is a trick question. How many? 40. 40. Nope. Who said 80? 80. 80 is the number. Why? He was 40 years by himself, and then 40 years with a whole bunch of people. He went camping. So he did it 80 years. He, you know why he went first 40 years? He went was to scope out the land and know it. He knew everything about the land because what was he doing for 40 years? He was sheeping, right? He was sheep herding all over the place. The next 40 years, what was he doing? He was sheeping. <laughs> Just had a different group of people. Uh, God's got a sense of humor, doesn't he? It is great. Um, 40 years, 40 days. 40 days. We've had a lot of things for 40 days because Jesus was tempted. For, no, not for 40 days. He was, he was fasting for 40 days before he was tempted. Okay? Um, that's an unusual number. Why 40? How many days can you make fasting? 
four? <laughs> Two? I'm thinking a meal? <laughs> yeah. Huh? 40 minutes. 40 minutes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Um, but but it, but that's used there. Um, uh, in, in Ezekiel, he laid 40 days on his side to demonstrate that Judas, of Judah's sins. He was using himself as a physical demonstration. When the spies went in, what? What's, what's that mean? It says 40 days. It's two words. Yeah. Yeah, it's 40 days. Well, it either says 40 days or 40 years. I mean, we're talking about the number 40. Yeah, no, no, no. I understand what you're saying. I, I understand what you're No, we're talking, about, we're talking about the number 40, but different phases of it, maybe 40 years or 40 days. Um, for instance, we're talking about the spies. They, went, they were sent out for 40 days into the... Uh, to the promised land to discover it, this is what God has promised us. And they saw what it was promised. It was a land of milk and honey. And two of them came back with a good report. And the other ones died in the wilderness. <laughs> and be careful how you report on what you see. Um, um, usually 40 usually represents a generation of man uh, in certain periods. And some people will say 70. But I can't see it in scripture where it ever says 70 is the number of a generation. We would usually... Um, it usually goes by 40. Uh, it's interesting. The Bible was written by 40 different authors. I didn't make that up, but the Bible is written by 40 different authors. Um, so the significance, it seems like in Scripture, holding it at number 40 is very important. Uh, God brought a rain and a flood to the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, just in case you didn't know they went together. <laughs> I always think, why does God do that? Does he not know if it's 40 days? It's got to be... But he does it to make sure we're, because we're knuckleheads. So he helps us out sometimes. Um, Jacob died in Egypt, in Egypt, and the Egyptians spent 40 days embalming his body. I don't know how I was so, what was the big deal? But uh, I, the Egyptians have a very unique way of wrapping it and then putting it in this, the, what is it called, spices and stuff, and then wrapping it and then, to where uh, it keeps the body. Uh, so... Both, both Esau and Jacob were married at 40 years old the first time. How about you guys? You want to wait? <laughs> no, I'm looking around the room. There's not a whole, there's not a whole lot left. <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting. In the book of Judges, the predominant judges judged 40 years. The less predominant, the ones that didn't, do, didn't go. So we have Othanel, who was the first judge. Deborah and Barak, Gideon, Eli, all judged for 40 years. Um, David and Solomon each reigned 40 years. So the significance as we look at this, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a time period that God gives people. It's not arbitrary. Uh, if you want to find some spiritual significance out of that later, let me know. But I, I just think it's interesting that you take all these things together, what do they have in common? The time period that God used. I don't know if there's anything really significant. Um, I'm sure that somebody will come up with something, and that's good. Um, but as we look at this, though, it is a time frame that God says will, judgment will happen. Um, now, it's, it's interesting in this case, um, the 40 days that were give, given, we don't know when the time period ever ended. We don't know what happened. We know what had happened from Jonah's preaching but there's no place where the time period actually said, okay, it's still time up, judgment's coming. And you say, well, they repented and God relented on his judgment, but they did get judged later after they did what? After they took this northern kingdom into captivity because God still used them as a tool, which is kind of interesting if you think about that because um, in this time period, it's probably about 30 years away from that happening, if that. It depends on where you date Jonah. Okay, and Nineveh, which is the Assyrian Empire, is going to take them into captivity. And you're going to say, are, did they take them in as a pagan nation or did they take them in as a, as a saved nation? And I, I'm going to answer you, really, I don't know. I just know God gave them that time period. And we could see certain facts that are out of that. And God did later take care of that nation. Um, 
by dealing with them. Uh, when you think of God's grace, what do you think about in light of what we're talking about? What comes to your mind in light of God's grace and the 40-day period? What would it require for you, if you were to give somebody a 40-day period and they deserve something, rightly so, and you gave them 40 days, what would you, what would you be saying about yourself? Think this through. I, I couldn't hear you. I love it. I'm very patient. I'm patient. Do you know how patient I would have to be? I know, I, if that, I'm the kind of guy I looked at the mailman today and I said, yeah, you're seven minutes late. He goes, I didn't know I had to be here at a certain time. Oh, yes, you do. I've done your job. I know where you're supposed to be. We we're just joking about that kind of thing. But there are certain things you get. Certain people seem to have more patience to certain things. And, you know, I, we used to go to Disney when the kids were little and the sign would say, after this point, you have an hour wait. After this point, when if I was near that point, I wasn't waiting. We would, you know, I'll go get drinks. I'll take the kids to the bathroom, whatever. Um, I don't like waiting. And, and Lizzie would say, well, this is God's way of teaching you patience. No, it's not. No, it's not. I talk with God. This is, not, this is making me irritable. This is not making, not teaching me anything. But what, why I'm saying this is a reason, because what I'm doing is I'm getting heated about waiting. Right? I mean, many of you have done, oh, I've got to wait. You seen the commercial with the little kid that now is supposed to be the adult and he gets the number, what is it, 14 or whatever it is, and it's number 83, and because the other one throws the phone, but they, they do this. Go to, go to 2 Peter, real quick. 2 Peter 3 9. I want you to look at this. The same word, God uses it. Um, it's interesting because everybody's got their own personality, and my personality says, I ain't waiting. I just, I don't, I don't like to wait. But God's personality says, He, he is different than us. And even jo- uh, Jonah knew that, and we'll see that in a second. But we'll go to Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter chapter three. And God's choice of words here is fascinating because in Second Peter chapter three verse nine it says, "The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you." The word "patient" is not "hupomone." Hupomone is basically He's bearing up under a load. He can, has a load bearing ability. It's macrothumeo, which basically means he's got a very long, long burning point. He doesn't uh, explode easily. and uh, Basically, he doesn't. Uh, uh, thermos has to do with burning point or passion or, or anger. And you put macro in front, front of it, it means long. So how, when you say God is patient, we also use in the Old Testament say he's long-suffering. Kind of, because that would be me. If I was trying to force patience on me, I'd be suffering, because I'm not going to be patient. I, I'm just not. It's, I've worked on it, and the more I've worked on it, the more impatient I became about not being patient. <laughs> and but you're, you're there is a, an ability to accrue patience. God is in Himself very patient. God has a long fuse. God doesn't mind waiting because He's got a purpose behind his waiting so let's go back to Jonah and and let's see how Jonah looks at it and we'll go back to chapter 3 but Jonah chapter 4 Jonah chapter 4 verse 2 and he says he prayed to the Lord and we'll go back to this in a few minutes but he prayed to the Lord please Lord was not this what I said when I was still in my own country now when did he say this I don't know I don't know if when he said it he probably said it here upstairs in his brain he says, well, isn't what I said in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarsus. So he probably said this in his head before he ran off to Tarsus. For I knew. You know what's really good is to know God, but don't play it against him. He knew that thou art a gracious. So 40 days deals with the graciousness. He's compassionate. He's willing for Jonah to go to these people that are well uh, polytheistic as possible. Okay, he's slow to anger. He's macrothumeo. He's got a long burning point. Okay, and abundant in chesed, that loving kindness. Uh, A very difficult word. Most people have translating the Hebrew to the English. I think it's close loving kindness. 
uh, in conjunction with grace, I think that has to do with, and one who relents concerning calamity. And Jonah didn't want that because he knew who God was. He wasn't saying, God, don't be God. He says, God, don't let me be the one to be in the middle of this. Uh, That's what he was looking at because he knew God would be God. And when we talk about this time period that he gave them, God was being God. Um, In James chapter 5, we don't have to turn to it, verse 7, it talks about a farmer waiting patiently for his crop to come. Uh, So the crop, you you first got to plant, and then you wait. And there's certain things you wait for, and all of a sudden you, oh, it's there. Uh, So um, a farmer waits patiently for his crop. Um, So God's purpose in waiting, especially according to 2 Peter, is because he wasn't wishing for any or willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So you take that idea in 2 Peter 3, 9, and you plug it into Jonah, and what he's basically doing is saying, I'm giving you 40 days because I'm a God who is long-suffering because I want them to come to repentance. And what happens in Jonah chapter 3? They come to repentance because we saw that in Luke chapter 11 that it said they came to repentance. Okay? Um, It's interesting. The message of Jonah plus 40 days plus God's patience gave Nineveh time to do what God had wanted all along was for them to repent. A simple message. Um, It's interesting because that's the way God does things. And we don't like it all the time. Um, so let's look at uh, Jonah chapter 3 verse 5 and 6 let's look at the response of the people how do they respond to the message and we know from Luke that it responded they responded with a positive they repented Um, and again in the Old Testament framework you got to understand it repenting had the duality behind it You either had to change your mind like you understand the Old Testament. But if the Jews were repenting, they were returning to God. If a foreign people repented, they turned to a God after understanding who who He was, and they did what? They believed Him. Okay, which is interesting, because verse 5 says, Then the people of Nineveh believed in God. According to Luke, from Jesus' words, they repented. See where they're both involved? And they called a fast. Um, They didn't call a fast and then repent. They didn't call a fast and then believe. They believed and they called a fast. And they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Which is kind of interesting because we don't know where uh, he was mourning. We don't know where he's at um, and how he learned that because that's more of a Jewish response. Um, But let's just look at it in a contemporary sense right now. What message came along with Jonah? Because we want to get the idea of the sign. Jonah was assigned to Nineveh, and he had a message, a verbal message to them. So I think both are incorporated. Because Jonah, you got to picture this guy. I don't know what he looked like physically, how big he was, you know, bearded, um, those kind of things. But I'm going to tell you something. He, uh, when he walked around, he was a sign announcing judgment to Nineveh. What did he understand about God's judgment? Did he understand about anything personal about God's judgment? I think this is true. This is a loaded question. It's an open Bible test if you, if you want. You can look in your Bible. Okay. Um, before he had been to Nineveh, he had been where? Belly of a fish, don't say whale because we're not sure. A dag, we're going to call him a dag for now because <laughs> that's the Hebrew word. But before that, he was even in the water going down, 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 and then and may have died in the water. We're not sure which way it, it was because the Bible doesn't really. Is so, but we know he's in the fish. I don't know what he looked like. I don't know what he smelled like. I don't know if he could erase that stuff. I don't know. That's all assumptions. But we do know the Lord said he was, a, he was a, a sign to Nineveh as he would be assigned to that generation. What did they both have in common? They have a story of being judged and being near either death or near death. I can't prove it for Jonah's case. I know I can prove it for Jesus. And then being brought back 
Okay, and, and when Jonah went around, he could point to himself that he was that God judged him, then God delivered him. God judged him, and God delivered him. And that's incorporated in the message because he's assigned to the people. People could just ask him, Jonah, you're different. Where have you been? I've been inside a fish. I don't know. My mind wanders because I still think he was bleached a little bit. I just think he... That's my personal opinion. I can't prove it, though. So, um, But we do know from his words, he goes, at the end of jo- Jonah chapter 2, verse 9, he says, salvation is from the Lord. Jonah, as a sign, he had to point to something. That's what a sign does. Doesn't it point out something? I, I sent Chuck a really funny one, because we're driving through, I think it was New Mexico, and there's a guy on a horse, and I said, I never knew you had to beware of cowboys. I don't know where you have to drive in this country. So, wow, we had a problem with cowboys inadvertently crossing the road. So I took a picture because I thought it was funny. But it was a sign telling me to watch out for what? Crazy cowboys. So I'm looking out. I said, Lizzie, have you seen one yet? <laughs> you know, and then a few miles down the road, there was elk. And then there was deer signs. And I'm saying, well, I haven't seen anything. I've seen the wild cowboys. I haven't seen the elk. I haven't seen the deer. What am I worried about? But the signs were there for what? To let me know they might be there. To keep a lookout. So I was... It's like an ongoing joke with us in the car. Have you seen one? Have you seen one? Um, so when Jonah came, think what the Ninevites were doing as Jonah was being that sign. Have you seen? You understand? Have you seen Jonah? Have you seen that guy? He's got a story to tell. Along with this message he's ramping, but he himself is a story. He's pointing us to something. That, and I believe the two things he's pointing to is that there's judgment coming. He's proof of it. God judged me individually. He's going to judge you and the only way to get out of that judgment is for God to deliver you. And how I know that is because they responded in fasting. And fasting didn't have many sides to it in the Bible. Basically, four sides. You either fasted because you mourned, you were lost something. You were concerned about your loss, so you were so involved in the concern for your loss, you fasted. Or you were making a request, and you were so consumed by the request, you fasted. I don't think any of us have really done that, have we? Been so consumed? I mean, it might have been. Um, but I think we're just not, we've never been involved with things to where we say we're so uh, encompassed with grief, maybe mourning at a loss for someone that we don't eat. Um, I know um, when my brother passed away, my mom didn't eat for a long time. I had, we had to make, basically make her eat for a while. Um, um, they were also, another reason for fasting was for confession of their sins because they were so obsessed over the horrible, horribleness and the nature of their sin when they realized what it was, um, they couldn't eat. Uh, and then the last one that has basically an official feast, it was a significant time to be absorbed with what God had and focus on God so they, they didn't eat. They were absorbed with what they were doing. Um, uh, and I think sometimes we don't realize what's going on here. So the fasting that mattered here at this particular time, it indicated a time of meeting an, ins- an intense uh, spiritual need. And I think that's what's going on. These people uh, realize where they're at. They, uh, as we've read in Deuteronomy, they were doing the detestable things. And God is one who convicts of sin. And it's really interesting because nobody said to them, go fast. There's nothing here that says go fast. Be a good time for you guys to fast. Uh, I, I've known churches that have called a church wide fast. I, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. Uh, verse 7. Yeah, well, uh, wait, wait, wait. We're going to get to that. Um, don't jump ahead. <laughs> Take all my firepower out when you do that. Um, but they were consumed, I believe, at this time with spiritual matters. Um, let's read. Now that we said, let's read verses um, seven, eight, and nine. It says, and, and he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. This is what the king said in Nineveh: By the decree of the king and his nobles, do uh, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. Both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth, and let man call on God earnestly that may, each may turn from his wicked way and from his violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we shall not perish. Now, here's the things that's interesting. Um, they had done this first, and then the king decreed it. Okay, they had done this first, and then the king decreed it, which is interesting because they had done it, and the king says, now I'm going to make it official. 
Uh, I'm going to put my state seal on it. That means he's involved now. Um, I don't know where he got the understanding of don't let man, beast, herd, or flock taste the thing because I've never really, I can't find anywhere where your sheep can't eat. You can't. Um, but he also says from water. So I don't think this is a very long fast. Um, uh, it, um, but here's what he recognized, and I think this is where I want to focus more than anything. Because he understands who God is. In light of his polytheism, in po- light of their nation's polytheism, he said, this God's different. Will he relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish? He understood that attached with this God, when he's angry, he will do us under. He will do us in. He will take us down. We'll perish. Um, he understood that where other times the calamities were vague and, and, and man-centered kind of thing. So let's leave, read verse 10, because if you notice in verse 10, there's a paragraph break, and that basically starts chapter 4 if you have a Hebrew Bible. Um, it's really interesting. Um, if you have a computer program and you're looking up, especially in the Psalms, they won't match. The numbers won't match. Um, but they are, all the verses are there. Just, numbers don't match. They use different horses, I think. And every time a horse hit, they verse verse. But I know why I did it with the Psalms, though. They gave different verse breaks. But verse 10 really starts chapter 4. You need to understand that. Because when God saw their deeds and they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning their calamity, which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. So forget the 40 days now. They had turned. He didn't do it, but that doesn't mean he's not going to do it. (laughs) Let me explain. This generation would not get it, but Assyria did get it. Because guess what happened in the next generation? They went right back to the ways they were doing things. Um, As a matter of fact, I cannot find historical records of too much of their change other than Jonah. Because we get the book of Nahum, and it tells how bad this generation 